Well, thank you, Mara and Drake University for inviting me here today. What an honor to be here and participating in this just fascinating symposium. And today I'm looking forward to sharing some of my research on the early history of Drake University and the surrounding neighborhood. I'll be providing a, an abbreviated historic context for why these Saarinen dormitories were so very needed um, when they were built and providing an overview of student housing approaches used by the university during its first 50 years. Excuse me here. Slideshow. Top. Okay, thank you. This is a Mac person using a PC. It's just a different world from the beginning. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. So my research is drawn from my master's degree thesis and related studies in historic preservation, which focused on the benefits of historic preservation in urban private university neighborhoods. And so as part of that, I was looking at how did universities get to the point where they are today? And, and that was kind of drawing me back into the, the beginnings of these universities' foundings. And I can tell you that Drake University's story is both unique and very similar to other urban private universities. And with that, I will take you back to the 19th century when Drake University began. The university opened its doors in 1881 as a Disciples of Christ-affiliated private college and operated most of its first 50 years without dormitories. In the early decades, this was an intentional decision. The university officials preferred students live with parents or board with good Christian families to ensure um, this ideal kind of educational environment away from distractions and vices of the city, University Boosters designed a new residential suburb here in Des Moines with a small campus at its heart. They called the new university Drake and the suburb University Place. And this map, an 1876 map from the Atlas, shows the future site in that circle. And it's also showing the northern boundary of the city, that blue uppermost line, horizontal, and then on um, the western boundary of the city. And so they're purposefully choosing an area just outside the reaches of the city. And selling lots in a real estate venture would ensure it, the promise of a steady stream of income for building this new campus while populating the community quickly. Fundraising for the university began with $20,000 from the well-respected General Francis Marion Drake a Civil War hero and a railroad tycoon and brother-in-law of the first university chancellor, George Carpenter. This is showing the western limits of the city. Um, as you can see, very rural um, situation. To facilitate suburban and university development, the university land company purchased 139 acres outside the northwest city limits. The land company consisted of General Drake, George Carpenter, for whom Carpenter Avenue is named, and some of you may have driven in on that today, and interested Des Moines businessmen and church leaders, some of whom were university trustees. This 1882 map, just a year after the purchase of the land, already shows the uh, early Drake campus in the circle there and the early platting of those lots. It was platted into 456 residential lots around a five-acre campus. For each lot sold, the land company gave the university a quarter of the proceeds. The university land company platted the land using a grid system, the simplest and most economical means of dividing land, which matched the goals of the land company, to make money for the school and encourage families to build and settle quickly. The uniform grid system also set university, a pla university place apart from the central city's somewhat haphazard development. And you can see um, in part due to location of the river that down in the lower uh, quadrant over there, the, the grid system is interrupted. Strategically, University Place also had only one route to downtown Des Moines, the old military fort road called Cottage Grove Avenue, which we still use that name today, and it's the diagonal that's coming up to the red circle on the map. This limited access allowed for the university to carefully control and regulate interaction between city and students. In 1881, the Drake University catalog, the first for the new university, emphasized the profoundly moral and Christian character and influences of the school so that, quote, parents may feel assured that their children will come here and have the very best influences thrown around them. 
Most of the students can find lodging under the immediate care of some of one of the professors or in Christian families near the university, end quote. The catalog also listed key campus laws. Students are required to abstain from profanity, the desecration of the Lord's Day, gambling, all intoxicating drinks, from visiting any saloon, billiard room, or any other place of improper resort, and from whatever else is inconsistent with good order, good state, and moral grounds. In addition, no student will be permitted to leave the vicinity of Des Moines without permission from the faculty. A little different from today's rules. The university building campaign started humbly in 1881 with a wooden frame building called the Student's Home. And in this woodcut that was used in various advertisements, um, the red arrow was pointing to the, the humble Student's Home. This served as a temporary general use building, including the first on-campus student housing, until the, the brick main building, which of course we call Old Main today, was completed in 1883. The first faculty members also lived in the student's home until they had built houses. And the student's home housed about 80 students in 1886 when um, it was mostly being used for housing. It was cramped and uncomfortable, and so the home served until 1894 when the building was sold, disassembled, and the components reused to build Victorian row houses a half block away. And those still stand today. By one measure, the removal of the student's home demonstrates the quick success of the University Place real estate development. Another way of measuring the success is that the university gained $64,000 from the University Land Company lot sales in its first six years. The 1894-95 Drake catalog, which was a, a main me method of advertising um, the school, advertised that, quote, University Place is a happy circle of Christian homes. Nearly all the houses are new, and many of them have all the modern conveniences. With such surroundings, the university has not felt the need of dormitories. And these are just showing some of the, the advertisements that were going on. Drake eventually entered directly into real estate development with the dissolution of the land trust. And houses such as this, um, which is still standing on 26th Street, would um, have populated the surrounding area of that original five-acre campus. And this map here, which is from an 1890 lots uh, auction advertisement, shows little stars indicating where houses had been built by 1890. And again, we're looking at north of uh, the original campus where Old Main is located. And some of those stars are probably where we are today. And then also the square numbered or the rectangle numbered boxes are showing lots that are available for purchase. So the ambitious plan of building a suburb and a university from scratch met with great success due to several factors. The success predictor number one was that, the, that there was a track record. The Disciples of Christ Faithful had experience building colleges, especially in the wilderness. And in 1881, the land where we are today really was quite wild. It was a mixture of woods and farmland with no city water or gas lines or public transportation. The Protestant Disciples de uh, denomination was born on the American frontier in the early 1800s, and a key religious tenant was a quest for Christian ecumenical unity. The missionaries set up colleges across the Midwest, South, and West to spread the faith and educate ministers. And like Drake, many of these institutions were co-educational and non-sectarian. Success predictor number two, if at first you don't succeed. Drake University was the reincarnation of an older Disciples of Christ College, Oskaloosa College, founded in southern Iowa in 1857. Because Oskaloosa College struggled financially due to its governing structure and remote location, boosters learned from past mistakes and restructured the new institution. And the real estate development plan offered again this promise of a steady stream of income, which was very important. Success predictor number three, suburban flight. In the late 1800s, suburbs were booming in cities across the country as middle and upper class families sought relief from crowdy, crowded, noisy, dirty cities. And Des Moines was no exception. University Place promised a planned community with spacious residential lots, alleys, sidewalks, wide streets, a public park, churches, and of course, Drake University. And all of this was two miles away from the central city. In addition, by creating a suburb, the temperance-supporting Disciples of Christ members could ensure that no taverns or related vices would be located nearby. And this map, which is actually from 18, or 1934, shows um, successive boundary changes with the city. And in the circle that's, 
the Red Circle, it's University Place, and it's one of eight suburbs that were all annexed in 1890, um, which expanded the city's holdings considerably. Success predictor number four was that education sells. Colleges were an attractive amenity for drawing families, much like a mall is today for suburban developments. A university could provide the surrounding community with culture, entertainment, and religious instruction. Drake University drew Disciples of Christ families from Illinois, among other places, who relocated here so that their children could receive a quality Christian education. Can you imagine someone moving their whole family, building a house in the middle, middle of kind of nowhere, just so that their kids could go to college? That's, that's a, a sacrifice I don't know how many of us would make today. And this was especially the case for families um, with daughters, as social mores required that young women be under the watchful eye of relatives or close friends. And this house, um, once located on 27th Street, was built by a widow. She had two daughters that attended Drake. They had some distant cousins that boarded in the house. And this is a common kind of, of um, story behind many of the early houses built here. And this house is on the National Register of Historic Places. The university's um, early growth and campus expansion needs appear to have inspired the Board of Trustees to consider alternatives that would have avoided intruding into the surrounding residential neighborhood when they needed to expand. Because uh, this was also important because land values were continuing to rise and so were houses. The university looked to establish a polytechnic campus nearly two miles west of the original campus in 1889 as a means of avoiding building in the university place neighborhood. In 1890, the board tried to establish a polytechnic school on the east side of Des Moines. Neither plan came to fruition, however. Meanwhile, University Place's growth inspired other land speculators to begin nearby subdivisions, such as Kingman Place, located west of 28th Street and south of University Avenue. In this newspaper advertisement, it's um, been about two years since they introduced this subdivision, and they're showing, here's the houses that are built, here's our convenient electric um, trolley route that comes into our subdivision, you should buy a lot here. And this is one of the houses that still stands. And this one, I believe, still stands, although the, uh, the upper open porch has been enclosed or area up there. And this is a, the uh, chancellor's, one of the chancellor's houses. The university did not provide housing for presidents, and so there are many houses that were built by presidents, and some of them still stand. This does, the original brick face is covered with vinyl siding. Um, the university administration's distrust of, of dormitories remained very fierce into the early 20th century. Again, looking at a university catalog, this from 1903-04, the, the uh, university spoke of dorms as um, dangerous to the health and morals of students, and instead the university advertised, quote, home advantages found in the attractive homes of University Place. The prices are reasonable, and the community is in the hearty sympathy with the university. And this shows, <clears throat> again, kind of the, the fever that lots, uh, lot sales could have. These are, this is from the, the yearbook, and students rushing off from graduation to buy their lot and build a house. And this is showing Old Main, and Jason uh, talked about two of the planned vistas in the city of Des Moines, and, and my belief is that Drake built the third planned vista after the state capitol and the courthouse. 26th Street was centered on to Old Main, and this is a, kind of the reverse of the planned vista, looking out onto the neighborhood, um, this Christian circle of, of uh, supporters of the university. But the need for housing began to outstrip the supply of houses. By 1895, total university enrollment had more than tripled to 868 students. Enrollment had again doubled by 1907, when 1,764 students were enrolled. And by 1924, enrollment hovered around 2,500 students. In response, in the 1910s and 20s, students began to rent apartments and houses or rent entire houses, often affili affiliated with sororities and fraternities. At the same time, traditional university supporters, such as alumni, professors, university place Christian church members, were increasingly moving west and northwest of the campus into more fashionable neighborhoods. 
As time went on, quote, University Place lost some of its student home atmosphere through change of ownership of residences. Rentals became more a matter of business and less a matter of accommodations, noted Drake uh, history professor Charles Ritchie in his history of the university. And that, uh, that kind of change in relationship helps tell the story of what has been at various times called the Craig House, and today is the Judicature um, Society's location at 2700 University. And it was built by Chancellor Craig as a second or chancellor's house, a larger home. It was then sold to a professor after Craig left the university um, and purchased back by, well, purchased by the university for some of the first dormitory type housing for women in 1920. So this, this is that story of, of uh, buildings changing from single family to multifamily. Overall, um, the prevailing views on housing students changed mostly after World War I as social mores changed. University students included worldly war, uh, war veterans and working young people also began to compete for boarding and apartments with university students. Um, as Ritchie, the history professor, noted in, again in his history of the university, the university began to be, become more acutely aware of the need of supervision over housing for its young people. The dormitory that has once been despised as a bad influence was now eagerly sought as protection against difficulties more real than those that had been feared at an earlier time. To further ease the housing crunch, in 1920, the university turned to, as we discussed, um, President Craig's house, and this, this uh, was in part started by a group of, of alumni who began fundraising for a new on-campus dormitory facility. Financing slowed construction and the university um, also preferred to build with cash in hand rather than carry debt. In response, um, in 1920, the university reversed its long-standing opposition to Greek organizations to ease the housing crunch. National affiliation provided the resources for more sororities and fraternities to rent and purchase houses and make uh, alterations as well. Numerous single-family houses served as, as quote-unquote Greek houses scattered over time between 22nd Street all the way up to 42nd Street, mostly between Forest Avenue and Kingman Boulevard. When the city's first zoning ordinance was made in 1926, multifamily zoning was approved around the university in recognition of the Greek houses, rooming houses, and apartments that were serving students. But the multifamily uses and declining home ownership rates also began to set the neighborhood apart. In 1927, expansion of the campus outside of University Place seemed sure when, the, when university officials made arrangements for merging with an east, um, east side school that was, was faltering, but plans fell through um, on the other universities' part. And so instead of expanding into Highland Park, the university announced in 1929, not the best year to kick off a campaign, but in March of 1929, this design is showing a, a whole new campus plan with a new entrance on 28th Street with plenty of dormitory space for men and women as well as designated uh, Greek house locations. And this was part of a $15 million expansion plan. And we know how that ended um, with the stock market crash and those expansion plans pretty much went to the archives. The university did go ahead to build a women's dormitory and it was not placed in the same kind of location as that plan showed. Um, Morehouse Dormitory, the ground was broken in 1931 and the 1932 yearbook um, included a five page story lauding the fireproof dormitory that really this uh, amount of press that was being designated really seemed to sum up the, the enthusiasm for the project. There's uh, some nice uh, excerpts that I want to read here that uh, talk about how, um, how much attention was given to the dormitory. Its lack had long been felt and its completion had been greeted enthusiastically, not only by students but also by those parents who through personal experience had come to realize the advantages, both intellectual and social, of living in a dormitory in intimate association with other girls during college days. The story also discusses the elegantly appointed dining room with its balcony and specially constructed floor suitable for dancing, as well as three large living rooms, quote, beautifully furnished to afford the girls additional opportunities for social life. And 
the, the young women that were targeted for staying in this were quote unquote out of town girls. The story later continues, an especially qualified house mother is in charge of the dormitory at all times and her time is devoted entirely to caring for the comfort, convenience and welfare of the girls. And there was also a dietitian on staff to oversee meals. In 1939, the university built the, the Jewett Men's Dormitory as a response to the need for men's housing, and that included a student union in the basement. Also during the 1930s, Greek organizations began to buy up large houses on 34th Street. Neighbors eventually sued the city over zoning variances to stop this multifamily encroachment in what was um, uh, quite a well-appointed street at the time. This 1934 planning map showing multifamily dwellings does show a concentration, not the highest in the city, but quite dense in areas surrounding Drake University. The financial hardships of the Great Depression and building supply uh, rations of World War II curtailed further campus expansion, as Jason also touched on, and the post-war pent-up demand for, for space was exasperated by the record number of students who enrolled in college spurred by the GI Bill. This became some of the new student housing. Returning war veterans, many with families, needed a different kind of housing. And the trailer court was created just north of the campus, and I did note there's a nice picture in here that shows the location in the uh, catalog. And so this was one option. This is, again, a picture taken from the student annual showing um, trailer campus home to 170 people, and that includes children and some dogs. Another response was to use Fort Des Moines for uh, both married student housing as well as single men housing. This was um, quite a commute, it was seven and a half miles and students had to be bused back and forth. So given this demand for housing, the financial incentives peaked for adding apartments to single family houses or turning houses into multifamily apartment houses. But the housing was often substandard and included uninsulated attic rooms and basements without fire egress. This is from the 1954 yearbook, um, and it, it was part of a large spread talking about how wonderful the new Saarinen dormitories were, and this was showing the contrast of this basement apartment that this poor kid is in 20, 20 blocks away from campus, and though it's clean, it's poorly lit. So, um, University leaders were also working actively with Greek um, organizations to recruit and support them. And in 1954, the Des Moines City Council approved rezoning 34th Street to multifamily, leading to the coalescing of Greek houses and creating a de facto Greek street. It also cemented the future of some houses as multifamily. And this kind of before and after shot um, the need for larger Facilities for sleeping and a more modern appearance led to remodeling such as this house on Cottage Grove Avenue. And it was once a, once a Dutch colonial revival then turned into a more modern looking multifamily structure. It was, uh, I don't know if abandoned is quite the right word, but is no longer used by the sorority, but it does continue as multifamily housing and not everyone in it is a student. Um, and so that, that, I guess, to me, sums up why there was such a need for the Saarinen dormitories to help fill this ever-widening housing gap. And I'd like to close by just talking a little bit about the after effects of these um, decisions on housing and how, how they've led to the development of the neighborhood as it is today. The growing number of rental units did play a major role in negatively changing the demographics, homeownership rates, and property values in the Drake neighborhood. Parking lots replaced houses. This was a, another story in a Drake yearbook talking about how they're needed, and especially with so many students commuting, um, they needed space for their cars. Um, as campuses sprawled in general across the country, adding large lawns and expansive parking lots, this pattern of development contributed to homeowners leaving and landlords or the university purchasing formerly single family houses for use as multifamily student housing. And it also created a disincentive for property improvement. The freeway also impacted the neighborhood. This is a 1958 article showing where the freeway route would be passing through the southern part of um, the Drake neighborhood. The university place name was, was no longer used by this point in time for the most part. And the number of absentee landlords um, definitely continued to rise and property values 
very much decreased. By the 1970s, the majority of the neighborhood was rental housing, and students were beginning to feel that they didn't want to be in all parts of the neighborhood. But there was also a great opportunity that was provided by um, these changes in that urban pioneers began converting rooming houses back to single family houses. And in 1979, a group of concerned residents that included um, Drake University alumni and employees created the nonprofit Drake Neighborhood Association. It was the second such organization in the city and it worked to turn around the neighborhood. Members researched the National Register of Historic Places nominations, wrote a neighborhood history book, refurbished original brick sidewalks, among other projects, and within a few years, the Drake neighborhood was named the state's most improved neighborhood. Today, the city has more than 50 recognized neighborhood associations and neighborhoods, and the Drake Neighborhood Association remains one of the largest and most active. And restoration work continues on houses, one house at a time. These are some houses that were rooming houses or multifamily now turn back to single family on 25th Street, just down the street from here. Um, a few years ago, the Neighborhood Association also successfully rezoned a large part of the neighborhood back to single family. The existing conversions are grandfathered in and less left vacant for a year. And as a result, a number of apartment houses have been returned to single family homes. This has not posed a hardship on university students as most people that were living in them were not affiliated with the university. Downsizing grants are also available to help ease um, costs for new owners. The Drake Neighborhood Association has also gained several additional National Register Historic Districts and individually listed buildings, which offer prestige and help market the neighborhood. Many families are choosing to live in the Drake Neighborhood, including a number of university professors and staff, as well as alumni. And despite the many changes, the original university place endures today because it was well designed. The original grid system laid out by the university is easy to navigate. The early housing stock has pr proved resilient and the core needs of students and faculty remain the same. Quality housing within walking distance of a campus is just as convenient today as it was in 1881. Only now we have paved streets. A committed community surrounding the campus also still works to the, to the advantage of the university because homeowners provide stability. As in the past, the future of the university and neighborhood will be closely linked. Thank you very much. Thank you.